Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to the 14th Tim Masso podcast. It's a pleasure to have you and our guest with us. I first met Romain Gautier at Watch Time LA, where I was moderating a panel on independent brands. All of his answers were thoughtful and thorough, and I regretted that I had to split the questions eight different ways. So here I've got him to myself today. Uh, Romain, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. A great pleasure to, uh, to be here. Thank you, Moscow. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask, because your background is in engineering. You're a native of the Valley du Jeu, but you came to watchmaking later in life. Uh, take us back for those who are new to your brand and uh, offer our listeners a brief overview of how you started in engineering, machining, and components and decided to enter the watch industry. Yes, absolutely. The, my background is probably a little bit different, but related uh, somehow with one of the hurt in Switzerland, with uh, the Valley du Jeu. So I was fortunate in a way, you know, to, to born in a place that uh, everything is surrounded by watchmaking with uh, most of the biggest uh, uh, luxury names, you know. Uh, and uh, yes, well, I grew up there. I did all of my education there. And surprisingly, or I don't know, maybe it's normal, uh, I was not attracted necessarily by what everybody was doing watchmaking and related with that. And I was really focused in terms of mechanics. I like a mechanism to understand, you know, uh, uh, the bicycle, uh, my, my um, uh, um, uh, um, tape player, you know, at that time we were listening music, not with the MP3, but with the tape. And uh, that was for me something really interesting to understand how it worked, this assembly sometimes, the screws and all of this. So I was attracted by, by this and related really in terms of electronics. And I started the mechanical school, the technical school in the Valley de Joux. In fact, it was related from electronic. I love music. I love uh, uh, all of the equipments uh, around all of that kind of topics. And uh, I guess the feeling about quality and the understanding started with the music listening, you know, with all of the support that can give you. When I, I started, so the, the technical school, um, and uh, after six months, uh, I clearly saw, and uh, you know, it was like a Roman, uh, the electronic is too abstract for you. Uh, you see that, you know, it's just uh, in a way like too theoretical, and you are a practical guy. And uh, hopefully for me, you know, uh, the first year and the six months, the first six months uh, was with mechanic. So how to use a manual lace, how to use files. So it was related with, uh, with metal. And I, I found myself very comfortable with that. And I said, Roman, look, you have pleasure with the mechanic it's related with mechanism the things that you like and electronic is too abstract so let's do the right turn for you and uh, I, uh, I drive I drove all of my education related with mechanics so four years in, in precision mechanics and then after that uh, um, it's a diploma in Switzerland which is related to engineer but more practical and I, I learned uh, also in a way to build and to develop machinery Yes. And when I was graduate, I did my military school. And my first job was to produce parts of watches. And I finally came back in Le Brassu, in a company that was dedicated and very famous for um, the wheels, in fact. And uh, I started to, my first job, uh, I started to machining parts of watches. And quite Quickly, I understood that Romain, you're born in the Valley, you have an engineer background about mechanism, machinery, and now you know how to use two machining parts of watches. So why you don't imagine to doing your own caliber? And everything started like this in my mind. So are there any figures in the watch industry? Because you are surrounded by the great brands, great craftsmen, the traditions of the area. Were there any specific people in your life from the area who inspired you or watchmakers who maybe you looked up to? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, you, you can imagine, uh, uh, I still continue, but we are surrounded by big names, which is quite difficult to access, you know, if you have questions, if you are a student or, you know, a young person. And uh, for sure, I was lucky that Philippe Dufour, 
was around and uh, I started to be in contact with him and uh, he was clearly my mentor the person who, who showed me also that yes from from scratch ID you can develop your own caliber and he really gave me the green light that in fact that it, it's possible to do that and also in terms of philosophy of uh, uh, about value you know you, you can do but until which level are you going to to grow the the human value uh, the quality uh, at the end and uh, all of the philosophy about the um, the well finish and the aesthetic and the sensibility about that I can say was related with also talks with him um, and I I don't want also in a way you know to undervalue but one of the things that probably gave me an advantage in the thinking that how, how to start in watchmaking. All of my life, I saw the big names. It means I saw posters, I saw, uh, I have seen watches and all of that, all of my life. So the time that I started to, to think about how to develop a watch, how to d design, all of my brain during those years was in a way, you know, uh, taking all of that kind of sensitivity. And this is also, you know, the, uh, in a way we can say, I don't know, but one of my mentors is the Valley de Joux, is the place where I'm, I'm born. This gave me a, a, a huge influence about what to do in watchmaking also. Yeah. Now, is it true that you, because this seems to be consistent with your philosophy of quality over quantity, but is it true that you only make about 50 to 60 watches a year? Yes. And I've also heard that you're actually involved in the quality control process. After the watchmakers, you look over each watch. How did that come to be? Yes, exactly. Okay, so the I can say, you know, uh, this was the fact in a certain time. And then after that, you know, the you you cannot be only concentrated in a way by, by, by you. In the thinking, I also gave to my team trust, you know, and confidence. And this is why it was also very important for me, you know, by traveling, uh, visiting collectors, uh, and all of the things are related with what I have to do, you know, from <laughs> the, all of the steps. I say to myself, Roman, you also have to give you trust to your team, the watchmaker, all, all of the things. So I can say today, I not necessarily check all of them, but I educate all of my team to reach the level of quality that is our philosophy. Is the it's my name on the dial, and I can say they totally respect that. You know, they don't have the feeling to work for a brand. Uh, you know that maybe you know it's too, it's difficult to connect, but they are connected with me. They know that if they don't do something well or something like this, this is directly going to coming back fast and to me. So this I also understood. And uh, I can say today, you know, and I don't see people around the world complaining or something like this. And I'm very happy because uh, I give autonomy for my team. Also, by give, giving to them today a kind of... Uh, yeah, I trust in them, and uh, and if I, I I cannot be there or something like this, I know that uh, it will be it will be it will be fine. Yeah. Now, because you are an engineer, um, you're, you're not a watchmaker per se, but a lot of times when I see watches that are designed by engineers rather than artisans, they're insanely expensive and crazy complicated, and they have weird time displays. Something like a Harry Winston Opus Eleven. Your watches are complicated enough but you're focused on the size of the anglage, the number of interior angles, black polishing. When did you make the decision to prioritize that kind of added value over say complication? Yes, absolutely. Uh, also, I can say we talk uh, with Philip, for example, and uh, with the understanding about maturity and, and where the human value can be, you know, really in terms of skills, and, uh, and now, so I, I don't um, uh, uh, undervalue the manufacturing side because I can say for you, personally, this is the most demanding side that um, in that level of 
work of product uh, we are facing. You know, the evolution of, uh, of manufacturing, uh, the cost of every uh, single uh, uh, place, you know, the working place for, for a person is completely different than, for example, a workbench for a watchmaker with, with a few tools, uh, yeah, you see. So it's highly depending on every step. But um, I, because it's my background to understand about manufacturing, uh, I, I understood about that the, the manufacturing gives ebosh. So this is the raw part, but those raw parts, they have to be as perfect as possible. We do parts for the brands also. So uh, I also had to explain about why it, it costs in a way so much, uh, really depending about the, the quality that you want to get at the end. If you reach and your target is, is to, to target the perfection, you have to start with almost perfection at, with the raw ebosh. So when the parts go out the machine, that piece has to be perfectly done. Not only the tolerance, the geometry, the quality surface or everything. So it means um, the quality that we do today, it's because uh, from also the manufacturing, we place that understanding about the quality that is needed from the starting. And then after that, for sure, you know, the skills and all of the, um, the human value that you can add is depending about the design. This took me in a way a certain time, but already with the HM, uh, the design with the interior angles, you know, was already with the rounded beveling, the big beveling was not something usual because so large the beveling is, so easy, you can see scratches, imperfections, and all of that kinds of things. So I was, you know, like, uh, wow, uh, this is a so large beveling that we see easily the polishing and what is a, a bevel. And I understood already there by the fact to doing sharp angular, you know, the sharp, uh, uh, when you have a corner and it became very sharp, the machinery fail in terms of it's impossible to polish for them. Uh, they can in a way manufacture, but go to the level to finish, this is just impossible. And years after years, I, uh, I understood and I said to myself, Homer, now you have the team, you have the knowledge in terms of beveling. So let's push the level up. And the logical one for me was for me the time to, to be uh, uh, a little bit more extreme in terms of beveling. And we did it. This was influenced because we got the, the know-how in-house. And I said to myself, Romain, now you have the team to do that. So you can create something much more complicated in terms of design. That type of design is not new, you know, but in the past, they did a the, uh, type of design like this. But the difference is they were not affected by quantities. They were not affected by industrialization, you know. So they were affected by the by the fact to be able to do and to doing it nicely. And I, I clearly decided that the value that we can bring with you know, an independent brand uh, and what the collector will be more looking for will be by the, in French we call that the bien facture. You know? This is the fact that yes, this is that one, but at the level that it's designed and finished, it became something unusual and not easy to find on every doors uh, that you can go in the street. And, and, and I clearly understood that um, my way was, will be with something not necessarily the most complicated and crazy that you can develop on, on the 3D. And then after that, with the, just the machinery, like Philippe Dufour say always, uh, it's the machinery that can be everywhere and it's done, you know. So, and I fully integrated that. And uh, yes, I'm so happy that I took that direction. And um, yes. And so for our uh, audience out in uh, the internet, and just keep in mind, folks, that you'll find Geneva hallmark movements with the Geneva seal that don't have even one interior angle where two bevels meet. On a Romain Gautier logical one, you're going to count over two dozen interior angles. So Romain, take me back. Because this is your iconic watch. You've been around making watches since 2005, but in 2013, the logical one, uh, the GPHG Complication Prize winner, it's become the definitive watch for your brand. Take me back to the beginning of the planning. How did you imagine that watch and how did it come to be? Yes, that was clearly oriented by the, um, the collector point of view. 
you know, when I, I start to have an idea or a development, I'm always thinking and place myself, if I will be a collector, what I will be waiting for. What will be something exciting that is not necessarily in the market? And I was focused about, you know, the idea in terms of physics uh, that we always listen, you know, person asking about, oh, is your watch accurate? What's the precision of your watch? And in physics, you know, when you have something which is non -con not constant, you, you mention about your question uh, in terms of with a relation. For example, what is the precision of, of your watch at T24? means 24 hours. What is the precision of your watch at T48? And this is how the company, the brands mostly, they test the watch. They test the watch after 24 hours of work and they, they decide we give the precision of the watch at, at, at that place. But if, the, if your power reserve is 80 hours, then after that, the precision is moving. And I said, how could we really talk about precision with something like this? And I said, oh man, in mechanic, in every machinery, everything is constant. So it's a really good starting in terms of, in terms of ID. And um, I had a look about the different mechanism that it was done and all of that. And for me, it came quite quickly uh, that the, the, the fusy chain was, um, from my perception, the one who really compensates something. Because, you know, you lose energy, you know, but you compensate by the, the principle of the lever. So with the torque. And this is physical, you know, uh, uh, from Leonardo Vinci and, and from the past, it was the simple way how to move blocks of, uh, of rocks, you know, of stones uh, from tons of, uh, of that. It was because the, the multiplication of the lever, you know. So this is a simple principle. It's like if you push the door at the in interior or at the exterior of the door. In fact, you do the same work, but not with the same demand of energy. And I really like that. And I, I also understood that Romain, that mechanism was used in the past, but you have to understand why it almost disappeared. And the chain was the point. Because the chain is the, in French, we say the maillon faible, the, the fragile links, you know? And, and, and it's that, in fact, you know? When something happened with the chain, then probably the entire watch is, is over, you know? And I said, Romain, if you go in that kind of mechanism, you have to think about the engineering of the chain and probably to reduce the length because the fact to enroll in multi-layers to, to, uh, to give um, torsion of the chain, this is not the best things as we can do. So I was working on that, how to reduce the length of the chain and to use that principle. I was extremely happy and remembered uh, that uh, I found this idea and all of that. And I, I went to see uh, at that time, Philippe Dufour. And I explained to him, I was so excited and all of that. And he said, Romain, it's nice, but you have to take care that people will not understand probably if you don't show it. So this is in a way from him that I decided to place the snail cam and uh, all of that mechanism on the top of the watch for uh, a small, Inside. And so, yeah, so for the folks who are following us, um, constant force devices, the Fusain chain, late Renaissance, uh, continuous constant force, unlike a remontoire, which pulses, um, but you do have the complexity and you do have the chain climbing the Fusain kind of like bicycle gears. So the solution with the logical one is to make the chain shorter, use a snail cam and keep the chain in the same plane throughout its travel. Um, and, and I gotta ask you because you've drawn attention from some major and minor figures in the industry. And in 2011, Chanel became a stakeholder. Uh, could you explain to our friends online, what is the relationship between Romain Gauthier and Chanel? <laughs> yes. Um, when this happened, it was something that it wasn't planned or nothing. Uh, and uh, I can say for you, when you have a, you know, a big name like this, you start to be interested about what you have achieved and how you know a simple guy with a small team was able to doing from almost A to Z. Uh, it was the HMS in titanium. And it was the time that I have presented that one. And they were impressed about how a team and a guy was able to develop 
to produce, to decorate, and to be in Basel world and showing something at that level. And you know, this was the work that we achieved, me and my team, who created that uh, that possibility. So. Uh, for sure, the, you know, the, um, it was a lot of talk. We had meetings and all of that. And, and at the end, you know, the certain point, the question came about, Romain, what is your vision for the future? What are you looking for? Uh, is it something that we can find a way to work together and, uh, and, and see? Uh, I'm, don't, I'm not going to talk about everything for sure. But this, you know, was for me a kind of, a big train who stopped to me and uh, it was in 2011 uh, it was already you know for me uh, starting from an MBA it was already 11 years of hard work you know uh, to achieve uh, to be there and uh, the situation was uh, was already you know after the 2008 2009 2010 and honestly at that time I have I had a thinking not just for myself, not in terms of equal, to think about has to be like this and all of that. You know, I did an MBA, so the understanding about about how to how to preserve, how to uh, how to manage the risk, and uh, and how to to imagine about the future. It, it was things that uh, I had a small, you know, uh, learn about. And I say to myself, Roman, now you have to think about your family, you have to think about your team. You have to think about the collectors around the world. You have to think about the retailers. And everybody wants to see you alive. And everybody wants to see you with, with a future that will be with, you know, uh, with the blue sky, with all of that. And this is what drove me the decision to say, uh, yes, I think it will be better for me than to be just just alone in myself and trying everything. And in my philosophy, when I did my MBA, this is the important point. When, when I did my MBA, uh, I, I did a final thesis during the last six months, it was dedicated about manufacture Roman Gauthier. Manufacture. So it means at that time, I did a lot of analyze in marketing with what are the, the risk for the brands, what are the good value, the, the things that we have to take care. And the understanding and the meaning about independence was already in, in mind, in me. So I did my MBA with the vision about the manufacturer because one of the key points for me for the future was to be autonomous. You see? So it means it wasn't, you know, necessary in the thinking about to think like everybody, uh, to be uh, with nobody and all of that. And, and, you know, a Chanel is not a group, you know, and this is just an incredible relation that I have today, which is absolutely fantastic. And, and <laughs> never I will regret, you know, the, the decision that I took all of the things that we did together and uh, all of the things that, at the end, I was able to manufacture that we are and that we have. And all of this is uh, because I took that decision. And, you know, for our friends who are listening out in cyberspace, uh, Romain Gauthier has also consulted and provided components to the Chanel high horology watches, such as the Monsieur de Chanel. If you look at the movement, you can see, shall we call it a family resemblance? And, um, you know, let me ask you a question, because as you mentioned, your thesis for your MBA was actually the business model for your, your company, for your watch manufacturer. So you survived the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, as well as the COVID downturn last year. Uh, tell me, watchmaking during COVID, what has the last year been like with the end of watch shows, unusual rollouts and debuts, uh, collectors unable to meet? How has business changed and how have you worked through that? Yes. You know, uh, the, the interesting things is before the COVID, you know, uh, it was already the topics uh, about the salon brands started to stop about and to find their own uh, uh, um, uh, question about, is it really necessary? Should we need about that? And uh, I will say, you know, it was complicated because it was like individual uh, uh, decisions. And the COVID just bring for everybody the same rule. You don't have any more. So now how we do. And, uh, and for sure, 
it has changed uh, the relation. And for me, unfortunately, and I, I guess for everybody, the most difficult that we are facing is the relationship that we have with women, with human, in the thinking about we don't meet anymore. We don't have, you know, we do Zoom, we do, uh, you know, Teams, all of that kind of things. But this will never replace, you know, the fact to be to be in front, you know, and 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 this is really something that will change and and already affect people all over the world. So it means today, for sure, I do also the, this reflection. I was not in that in that situation because I was really thinking about. We are too small. We need because Basel World bring us all of the journalists, you know, to us. And if we have to do that, if I will have to travel around the world to do this, it will be just impossible. So for us, it was a big investment for sure. But this gave me, in one time, in one week, the possibility to book and to and to meet journalists from all around the world. And uh, so my vision was not to to stop. But it was, you know, uh, uh, we already started to do a new booth in Basel World. Uh, everything was uh, after that stopped. So it means today my reflection is slightly different, you know, because with the the quantity of money at the end that we that we the, that we have saved, uh, and the thinking that um, we we see how our collectors, you know, around the world. Uh, continue to to be interested, to read, to react. Um, I don't want to say that we will never do again, but this is a thing that the situation today is so different that we cannot say yes or, or no because all of us we needed to adapt. But what I see, you know, uh, for sure we did more in terms of uh, uh, um, to find a way to communicate in different kind of, of support. And this is absolutely necessary, you know? The, the fact that you can do the best as you want for, for any kind of things, if nobody knows, no, nobody will buy. Anyway, if you, if you did the smartest things, the most incredible, the, the most rare, the most of what you want, if nobody knows, you will never sell. So for sure, all of the link that we had with Basel Wars, with all of the salon, it was maintained during that time. So we, start, we still continue to have contacts with all of, with all of the, the family, you know, journalists who appreciate us, uh, retailers, collectors, and all of that. And by this, we, we have maintained um, all of the relation. But I cannot imagine, for example, for a new brand today, this is an, another game, you know because you will have to create all of those connections which are not so easy you know you know the first thing the first the first things that you did is where we meet we met for the first time it, because human because uh, and and i think this is the things that me uh, i have the most regret today and i'm very excited to be able to travel again to to be in face to face and and to share like this and in terms of uh, collectors uh, and their interest in, in buying the high-end watches, uh, which parts of the world right now, because every area is recovering differently from COVID, where right now are the, the most active collectors who are most eager to buy and, and ready to kind of move on, move forward with their collections? Is it Asia, North America, a little bit of both? Yes. So two, two main places, we can say America uh, and first, for the moment, the, the first market is uh, Japan. We we sell a lot in Japan. Uh, Taiwan is also uh, working very well, and and there is maybe not a lot of surprise, but we also place the the value in this in those market in the thinking about we also have a active agent there. Like I said, you can do the best if you want, but if nobody knows, nobody will buy. So I know that that we work well there also because we have people who work for us, you know? It's why, you know, to work with retailers or it's just a necessity in a way, you know, because they bring what we do and explain to a place that we are not. And if people are, are, are um, if they have no possibility to be aware about that, they don't buy just it. So it means, you know, we have few points of sales already in US 
I'm happy with them. Uh, and it's related because I can say the, the work that they do there in, in the market. And for example, in places that we should have, like for example, for the moment in Middle East, for example, we don't sell a lot because we have nobody there, you know? And, and, and different type of, uh, of things bring to me the, the possibility and podcast, uh, you know, I don't want to, but you know, like the new trend, which is insane, like Clubhouse. Yes. Bring much. to me, you know, the connection to those collectors and, it, and it's just incredible and fantastic, you know? So uh, I can say the place that we will, we will, we will give um, the energy, we will give the financial support, we will sell. If we don't invest in a way in some markets, for sure, nothing will arrive by, by hazard, you know, in, in a way. So I, I also value, this is a work of human and uh, it's not just only what we do that can sell everything, you know. And I think for our friends who are listening out in the internet land, uh, it just goes to show how different the scales of independent brands really are because you'll have an independent brand like Richard Meal that makes 5,000 watches a year and it has its own stores around the world. And then you'll have a smaller independent like Romain Gautier with 60 watches. And the business model is much more personal, much more rooted in individual authorized dealers. So there is a lot of diversity in that space. Um, I guess that ship in the Suez Canal was like a symbol of the times we're living in. Have you found that because Switzerland contains most of your suppliers, you haven't seen much of a supply problem or, or were your supply lines affected in any way at the factory? So uh, we are also, like I said, we produce parts for the brands. So we are a supplier. So I can, I can talk about myself, you know, one side of the, of the, of the company. Uh, that was an incredible year. We had so much work, you know, and this is also related with, uh, um, we were able to face that difficult time because we build relation with some brands uh, that are very stable today and based on, on, on a certain, you know, but the ground is solid, you know. This is not something that you, we have just built and start to be fragile. So the step of we can call a startup for us is, is done. So we have much more stability. So it means uh, it, it was maybe for us, you know, a, a different situation because we were moving and investing a lot. And when, and when the COVID uh, arrived, it was, you know, the, already a stage of stability. And by this, it was a first, you know, uh, we already got a lot of orders. And, and in fact, globally, with what we are, uh, the manufacturer in all, all of the things, we did the best year ever, you know. And, and probably we, uh, we could do more. But by this, we maintain. And this year, start for in the all of what we have, will be, uh, should be, and will be a fantastic year. But just because, you know, it's also, like I said, uh, 16 years in June of work and 20 years of my life invested to build all of that. And we are, I can say, we are not fragile in a way. And we, are, we can face that kind of things. Last year, for example, I lost 100, more than 100,000 Swiss francs because a company that we order machinery did the bankruptcy. Unfortunately, they never asked about the COVID, but all of the, the brands, they had to, to preserve, you know, the investment and all of that. And this was affecting, you know, not just the supplier as, as we can imagine to produce parts, but the suppliers who provide the machinery as well. So those people were clearly affected. I know uh, some suppliers was also very affected, but this is, this is also in a way depending about the, the companies that you are working for, you know, the stability of them. And sometimes, you know, we learn in, in that kind of uh, place that we don't have a lot of clients, but we have super strong clients, you know, and it's maybe better in those times to have super strong clients than to have 40 clients, volatile and fragile. And then at the end, if you start to lose 80%, it's done, you know? Yeah. 
Yes, very much. And for our audience, it, it's important to note that many of the most successful independents also have uh, second identities as high-end suppliers of engineering and parts. Uh, Grubel Forsey has Complitime, Romago Chase supplies engineering know-how and components to large brands. Uh, H. Moser and C has uh, precision engineering, which makes hairsprings, escapements, and balances. And this is a part of the independent horology space that's not always acknowledged, but it's very important from a standpoint of financial security and independence. So let me ask you, Rama, beyond watchmaking, uh, you must have other passions. You've mentioned musical equipment and gear. What about sports or cars? Is, is there more to you beyond the watches, things you love? <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Valley de Joux is a, is a piece of nature, you know, uh, with a lake and, and you don't have necessarily, you know, a lot of activities that you can do, you know. So it basically, Every every boys and girls they do sport, you know, in different kind of level. We have, for example, a, a big a complex. Uh, in compare of the population, we have a big complex for uh, the swimming pool, the high hockey, the uh, different type of sport. And I did a lot of individual sport. You know, the, um, the DNA about to be autonome, the DNA about to be an entrepreneur was already, you know, when I was young, I was not a team player in a way I was more comfortable you, you do well you do well you lose you lose but it's yourself and uh, and I did you know a lot of bicycling uh, um, the downhill ski I did a lot of uh, of that so during um, almost 10 years you know um, uh, and then after that you know uh, I did a lot of uh, of uh, running uh, and a little bit of, of fitness, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people. Um, and this was, you know, really important because I understood w when I started my MBA, I had the good physical, uh, uh, um, uh, um, how we can say, um, reserve. Uh, exactly. And the, the MBA for the people who knows what it is and the investment that uh, is needed, if you are not strong with your body before, <laughs> then uh, it's probably uh, something complicated. So hopefully I did it. And um, I like I like cars. You know, I don't have supercars, uh, uh, I, I, but I like all of the environment since I, I'm young about cars. Uh, yeah, like the relation that I have with titanium is related to the bicycle. You know, at that time with uh, with uh, Colnago was so famous for the titanium frame and all of that. That was for me, you know, uh, the aluminum, the, the understanding about aluminum, titanium and cardboard fiber. If we look at the bicycle, we understand the progression the, and all of the things that we have today with, with the carbon fiber, for, for example, that, that things just gave the possibility to break all of the records of for, any kind of places that people start to use carbon fiber. This is just insane. And for sure, there is maybe some understanding that if you compare with a metal like titanium, titanium will be maybe forever, but not the carbon fiber. This is for sure. But if we don't accept, for example, if, we, if nobody will accept the carbon fiber, nothing of what we have today will be and we will still continue maybe to, to be, yeah, I, everything will be different. So I have, a, I have an open mind, you know, also about that kind of things. And I think, you know, the, the F1, the understanding about also, how could we ask everything in a motor if we see about a mo an engine that is used and made to do 200 kilometers or 200,000 miles, and an engine that is dedicated for a life, and every engineer pray that the engine will be supporting one race. And everybody are so amazed with the Formula One, and they want sometimes to get the reliability, the durability and everything, and the performance of the F1 in a regular car. So then start to, we have to understand that we cannot push the limits and get all of the security of everything and all of that. And, and for me, the cars is a perfect, a perfect example. I, I really love to see 
evolution, like McLaren, like what happened? If we think about the cars, it's a big topic for me. So stop okay. if you want. But Please keep going. But you know, my understanding is that you know, for example, when Pagani started about the, about the Zonda, it was around four hundred thousand dollars, and I, I said to myself, but how it's possible? It's so many things that they, they undervalue what they do. It's not possible. The price is not enough high, you know, at that quantity and all of that. And if we see today about the, the hypercars and the supercars, today it's not anymore three, four hundred, five hundred thousand. It's two million, three million, five million dollars, you know. And that's the, the level that they have to be to create those exceptional hypercars and supercars. And what we do in a way is related to that, that type of cars, you know, and the relation with the price and all of that, there is a lot of similitude, you know, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy that the car industry has pushed a limit because we will never got that type of hypercar, supercars without that. Because at the end of the day, everything has a value and cost much more money than yeah a regular things. Uh, that's a very good point. As you know, with cars and watches, the amount of engineering and handcraft that goes into the machine often determines the price more than profit motives. Um, it's just based on what goes into the machine. And speaking of machines, smaller machines this time. Um, well, first let me ask you: do, do you collect cars? I have to ask. Do you have any? Do you have a special car for weekends or a car you plan to add for weekends? Uh, not yet, not yet, you know, uh, I did quite a lot of things and I was really supportive in the thinking about my family, uh, the company and the family, the, I, I tried to, uh, to give the best as we can for, uh, for my kids, me and my wife house and, and all of that. So uh, I really focus, you know, on, on this and the company. And I know that I'm, I'm 46, uh, so it means I still have time. Uh, to enjoy, you know, a different things uh, in the future. But I'm really fortunate about what I already have. And the step of material like this, for sure, I always look at cars and all of that. And I know this is just a question of time and, and this will, uh, will, will arrive. We... <laughs> so, so if you get outbid on a Porsche GT3 RS on Bring a Trailer, it might be Roman <laughs> okay, beating you to that bid in the future. So, uh, yeah. Smaller machines then, scaling it down. Do you have a personal watch collection? Have you collected watches through the years? Do you, do you own any that aren't your own manufacturer or are your own manufacturer? Yeah, uh, I, I would love to do that. Uh, I have, yeah, not, not a lot, you know, but one uh, uh, that I really like is uh, I bought when I was 25 years old. Uh, I was lucky, you know, uh, uh, I have an AP Royal Oak, you know, and uh, I'm happy because at that time I, I was able to, by connection, uh, uh, to get the, the number 2000. And it, this was exactly, you know, when we did the step from 1999 to 2000, that some people were predicted at that time that uh, the computer will crash. And, it, you know, it was a big thing, the, the 99 to 2000. And I said, it was my 25 years old and uh, and I asked her about if uh, I could find a way to get the number 2000 and that watch will be with me forever because it's so much memory and um, and then after that you know uh, I started my MBA at that time and everything went through to develop the manufacturer to to place the money in in, in all of that and and this is why you know the uh, I have a big open mind uh, also, you know, like, like hearts, uh, uh, um, watches and cars. Um, yeah, if, if the life gave me the possibility, I will collect, you know, because I appreciate to, to have an open mind and uh, an understanding. And I, I'm, not, I'm absolutely not one of the person who think that we do the best does everything, so I don't need to buy any other things. No, I, I'm, I really have an open mind about that. And, uh, but like you understood, I place all of what I had in what we are. Of course. And, and I think that's a great um, sort of pivot point to ask, if you were to start all over again, if you were to start from the MBA, the MBA and the thesis where you planned your brand, 
What would you do differently if you could do it all over again, looking back? Uh, <laughs> this is a hard and an and extremely difficult question. Uh, when I did my MBA, for sure, you know, the, I, I had this in mind. You know, that was the most craziest thing there was to think about to build a, a, a new brand, a new new. Uh, new watch company in, uh, in that sense. And another thing was also to, to move to to US. You know, I love California. This is a place that is just insane for me. You know, I were always when I land to LA, for example, I, I, have, I really have the feeling that I'm be back home. I don't know why, but I love that place. And um, one, the second side of me was about that. To say probably in California, uh, I will find you know people interest and that my know-how will help and create something. So maybe like a consultant or something like that. That was also in my mind. You know. So I uh, I have met my wife in in California. You know in California Northridge University uh, for uh, English course during summer, and uh, they pushed me to uh, to do that in a way. You know. And I'm so happy that, you know, when you meet sometimes, you know, the right person and all of that, this influence you and, and, and all of this. So I cannot say that what happened is only my decision is because, you know, I also met my wife and uh, we decided that I did my MBA. She, uh, she has moved to, uh, to be with me. So it was really a, a big thing for me. And, uh, and this achievement that what we are is also due to my wife, you know, I should not talk about that to her. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, no, I'm kidding. And, uh, and yes, that's the, that's the thing. Now to, to, to go back clearly to your question. I don't know, you know, and, and things are better like that, you know, when we are young, uh, you know, it's like we don't know, but we do things because we don't know. When we are older, we know about, but we cannot do what we could do before in a way, you know? So it means I was probably very naive that everything was possible and in a way simple. And all of the year that we achieved, that we, that we passed, I understood the difficulties about what we are. And all of the necessity, not just, you know, about myself, but to build the right team, to have the right person uh, uh, around me uh, to support, to understand. And uh, this is so much things that are, are related. You know, I, I can make this start again, but, but without, you know, the, I would say the, uh, the life will maybe not drive me the same people. And then it will be a different way, a different things, you know? And it's why, you know, maybe yes to restart. If I just look at the difficult things, no, no, I will do another, <laughs> another Good. job. A confident if man we would not change a thing. I love it. So let me just ask you a question. Looking towards the future, we looked back in the past. I guess we'll sort of wrap up on this point, but are there any future plans you have for the brands? A style of watch you would love to release, a market you would love to open, um, perhaps an engineering feat you would love to realize. Do you have any plans or ambitions for the future that are still unrealized? Yes, you know, there is a quite a lot of things that we can that we can imagine, but uh, one of the points that we are facing with wristwatch is about the dimensions, you know. So this is always something complicated. So I will also have pleasure to work on, you know, something more like I, I don't know pocket, but table, uh, for example, things like this. Uh, you can express by a different way uh, mechanism that I, uh, I have in mind that could express, you know, a bit more yeah in a, in a bigger with a bigger amplitude you know and uh, this is for example the things that, that uh, I, I, I'm really interested um, the gravity is a big problem in watchmaking so I also appreciate that but the difficulty is we can break many many ideas in terms of mechanism but one of the beauty about the watchmaking is that the the, the engineering centuries ago 
was in a way able to after sale. The worry that I have today is about we use technology that the we never know, but in 20 years, probably that technology will, uh, will change and we will never be able to do it again. So the watchmaking was so conservative in the way to develop, in the way to think about that we need to do products that can go to generation. And this I'm very concerned about that, you know, and I, I see a lot of new, uh, new complication, new calibers arriving, but for me, with, 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 with technology, and my, a bit maybe too conservative, and maybe my relation with Philip and all of that, place me in the responsibility to think about the future. If something happened in, in 100 years or something like that, you know, in, in the future, we will use metal that I'm, I know that will keep the generations. So it means I'm... I'm interested about that complication. I will, I will develop step by step. The understanding, my background is different. So it, it means I go step by step with ideas, but gravity is a problem. Uh, uh, you know, the size for any kind of engineer is a problem at the end also. So I have, uh, I have a lot of things, but in, you know, in terms of complication, uh, yes, I like to think about it was done like this in the past because they had different kind of tools. They have different kind of know-how. And if we want to replicate that, we have to place ourselves in the thinking about if Abraham Louis Breguet, if, if Patek, if uh, Audemars, if all of those person Piguet, uh, will be alive, they will use the technology that we have. And we have to think about if they will use it as we do. It means to produce more, for the quantities or to be insanely more creative. And this is what I like. And, and, and we are fortunate, you know, because I know that the collectors, they are waiting for us, that kind of thing. They are not waiting things that uh, be a bigger brand. Uh, I can say with all of the Naha and the knowledge uh, and, and a thousand times better than us to produce quantities than what we are. So my side is really about that uh, they are waiting for other things from us. And for example, the, the level of bienfacture, the level of human value that we add in terms of finishing and all of that, is also, also one of the key. So for those of you who are listening, read between the lines and you realize that Romain Gautier's automatic watch looks nothing like a normal automatic watch. His fusée looks nothing like a normal fusée. So if you were to see a chronograph or perpetual calendar or a tourbillon in the future, rest assured, it's going to be something you've seen before as you've never seen it before. Romain, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much.